Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Well, if you have your Bibles, you may want to open up to Colossians chapter 2. As I went through this passage and I meditated upon it, I really could see coming out of this great passage the theme of having a heart for other people. And having a heart for others really requires, for us, first of all, for us to be thankful that God would bring people into our lives. And maybe that's where we ought to be as we begin this message is how thankful are we really that God has brought people into our lives. And if he has brought people into our lives, and he has, then it also means that God wants us to give back to those people. And the greatest example is God says, I love you and you are here. And so he loved us by having his son come to the earth and he demonstrated his love toward us. And so as this message is on us having a heart for other people, what you might want to do is do a little category, a little directory in your mind about the other people that are in your world that God brought into your world. For those of you that happen to be married right now, God brought those into your life, that person, that special one into your life, and you can be thankful that God brought that person into your life, but now how can you have a heart for that other person to really love them? Those of you that have been blessed with children and grandchildren, and sometimes you didn't have the choice of the children you had. That's the byproduct of a, of a marriage. And so now you have the children and the grandchildren. God said, I wanted you to have them in your world. And to be thankful now, we look for a way. How can we demonstrate a heart for those people? And then we could go on. You could talk about the people with whom you work or the church that you've selected. In other words, God has surrounded you with certain personalities and certain people that he really wants you to love. And often we don't have a choice by that. I remember these people were sometimes talking about being adopted. Our two boys were adopted, as you well know. And it was, they came home one day, and they were really upset because in school where they were at, the kids were real cruel to them. And one of the sons came to me, and he was saying, he said, Dad, I, I don't know about this adoption thing. They made fun out of us that, that we were adopted. And I said, well, i got an answer for you. If you could do this without causing a fight now, you ought to go to those other people and say, you know what, my mom and dad chose to have me I got picked, you just came as an accident kind of thing. And so they were able to see that and see that I'm real special. Well, some of you can now relate in the sense that God brought people into your life that you can demonstrate a loving nature. But now when you really love those people, if you truly love them, there's going to be a great struggle for them because as you love them, you have a, a purpose for them. You want to find out what does God want to do in their life and you want to partner with the Lord to help them to develop. Now think about that, even your mate. I hope you don't see your mate as someone who comes to serve you as much as God gave you that mate that you could then discover what is God's purpose in their life? What's their gifting? What's their personality? What's their shape? What can I do to develop them? And so now you partner with God by helping to serve them and to add value to their life. But to do that, if you really have a heart for them, then you're going to agonize for them, especially if they're walking a little bit off path. So you want to sense then that conflict that's coming within you. Now, for those of you that are not uh, just parents, you could look at your, your, the people you work with. Sometimes you really wish that your workers would be a little bit different. And some of you that have employers, you'd be thinking, I wish my supervisor would be a little bit different and have a little bit more character, a little bit more integrity. And so you agonize over that. Those of you that are in Christian leadership, I'm sure that your desire is that the people would come to faith in Christ. And if they've already trusted Christ, you don't want them just to have fire insurance from hell. You want them to grow. And if you really have a heart for them, there's going to be this agony that goes on inside of you wanting to know how do you get them to the next level. Follow along, if you will, for just a moment here. You'll notice the verse, the very beginning of it. Paul says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you, those that are Laodicea, and as for many as those who have not seen my face. That phrase, a great conflict, is a very unusual phrase because it comes from a Greek word that sometimes is translated, he had a great struggle. But it's actually coming from a Greek word that we've translated into a, an English word, which is the word agonize. So it's conflict, it's struggle. He says, I'm agonizing over those people. But also in this context, it's interesting because it says, the agony I have for you, then for those in another city, and then even for those that I have not seen. You know, it's interesting how that even with the people that um, we have around us, that we often don't show enough love for them, let alone the people we haven't even seen before. And Paul is saying, I agonize for those of you that I do know, that I, do ha I have met, but he also agonizes for those that he has not met. Well, let's see how that fits into this. 
You notice in John chapter 17, it says that Jesus prayed then for his disciples, and then he prayed for those who yet in the future would believe on Christ. So there was yet another whole a cadre of people that were out there that still haven't come to know Christ as Savior. So what the Lord was doing was looking at these people, praying for them, but also praying for future generations. And here's how you and I could sense out of this passage. We can agonize that each one of us would be growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. But at the same time, in our mind, in our mind's eye, we can envision our parking lot filled with cars. Two or three guys helping to stack the cars in our parking lot so that every piece of that concrete is covered with an automobile. That we're directing them over to the school across the street. That inside this room that we're trying to put up more chairs and we're having to put a camera here so that we can broadcast it into another larger room. And we're agonizing over these people so that they would grow in grace. We can already picture them ahead of time. And that's the conflict that he had. But now here's the biggest question. In this context, since it said, I agonize over these people, what would be three areas about which he agonized? And what I'd like to do is to look at Paul and say, okay, Paul, you love these people. You wanted to add value to their life. You agonize. What were the areas that really caused you the greatest inner conflict? And then what you and I would want to do is we want to look at our kids. And we look at them and sometimes we agonize because they don't clean their rooms. And maybe you kids, you agonize over mom and dad because they don't give you more freedom or they don't extend your curfew. Or sometimes church people will agonize with one another over a lot of different issues. But if we had to select three, and so we want to park on if we were to look at our kids and what would be three areas that we would agonize over them, what would be those three areas? And here they are from this passage. Number one, Paul wanted people to, wanted is a light word, it's really agonized over people to know Christ fully. And I'd mark that down. He said, what I'm looking at people now, I don't, I don't just see this lost person out there. He says, I see him lost, but I see them coming to a full intimacy with Christ. And so he really agonized over them that they would have a much closer relationship with the Lord. And I know how that feeling could be. And let me kind of share with you as, as your pastor here for a moment, and I'll kind of bring some things out as an application. Those of you who are our guests are going to maybe see me in a different way than I'm normally on Sunday. Most Sundays, I'm here just teaching the Word. I am passionate. There's no doubt about that, about the Word. I'm passionate about people knowing truth. But sometimes I don't really explain to you what goes on inside of me as your shepherd. I really do agonize over, over some of you. I look at some of you right now, and I look at where you could be, the potential. I can see you, that you were formulated in the mind of God, and you were placed on the earth. And I'm thinking that God in His great sovereignty brought you underneath the umbrella of this ministry and all that it has from the pulpit ministry to the connection groups to the social activities that we have, that God brought you under this. And I'm, I'm looking at all of this. And then I look at you and that God allowed you to be here. And as I look at you, here's where the agony comes in. I see the great potential that you have, but yet at the same time, I don't see the passion to grow in the Lord. I don't see the commitment for you to step away from some of the good things to have time for the great things. I see you filling up your schedule with a lot of stuff that we can justify as stuff that we could do. But I look back and I say, are you really different for God? Do you know more of his word? Are you more like him because of that? And so now what goes on inside of me is this inner conflict that I have. And here's where it is. I, I care for you. But I don't want to put you on a guilt trip because I know that there are tens of thousands of Christian leaders today on a Sunday putting their people on an unnecessary guilt trip. So I'm sitting there in agony and I'm saying, I know they got to go further, but I don't want them to be put on my guilt trip. And then I'm sitting up here and I'm saying, I'm so passionate about them, but I don't want to be misinterpreted as someone who is angry with them because I'm not really angry with them. And then I look at these people and I say, I don't want them to think that I don't love them. And if I get so passionate and I tell them about some areas that are out of balance in their life, that they're, this is what's hindering them from growing spiritually, they might not like me. And then pretty soon our relationship deteriorates after a year of this. Pretty soon I'm out of this church. And I don't want to do that either. And so I could feel where the Apostle Paul was. I could see that here he is in prison. And all he gets back are reports from the Christians at Colossae, a church he's never visited, but a church he knew about. And he's in agony over them that they would be fully mature in Christ. And I, I know that inner conflict that, that he was struggling with inside of him. I, I don't know it exactly, but if you love your people and you want them to be fully mature in Christ, you know what you see in them. Now, there's something else I took from this passage. Now, stay with me on this. While he was looking at them and he wanted them fully mature in Christ, even in the midst of the agony, he could still see good coming out of the people. And I'm going to bring out the positive, so I'm not here to beat up, and this is not a bully pulpit. So he was in agony, but I'm wondering if he saw the good and he thought, oh, you've gone this far. You went from good to great. Now you can go from great to greater. 
And so there was some agony in there. So even in the midst of my passion, and should I say something, I pray more than anything, you'll read between the lines and remember that we've loved you and I love you and I care for you. I want you to know that I'm struggling up here, that I won't be misinterpreted so that you would know how much I care for you and I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. I'm, and even if you don't do what I'm saying, I will, I will love you, I'll be with you. I'm not judging you, that's another thought. I'm not condemning you. But I want you to know what's driving me within me is I love the Lord with all of my heart. And I know that I have places to grow. And so as much as agony about you, I have agony about my own weaknesses and failures. But together with that agony, I want it to motivate us that we don't just sit soak and sour. There's, there's no disunity in this church. There's tremendous amount of focus and forwardness in this church. But I don't want us to get um, complacent in this church about wanting to be more and more like the Lord. Now, in this area that he says, I want you to be fully mature in Christ, he picked out three areas that I thought was important in our process of becoming more like the Lord. So let's look at those. Number one, he agonized that they would be more like Christ, that their hearts would be encouraged. He said, I want them to be encouraged from the word. And so here's my desire for you. I know that in this world here on, on Oahu, that there are things that could discourage you. You could look at the, at the, at the uh, newspaper, tourists that won't be able to afford to be here. And all of us are connected to the tourist industry in one way or another. You can look at the housing market. You can look at the high cost of our food going up. And I could look just from Friday to today, the gas on our corner gas station went up six cents. All right, now, that's not going to break us. We'll still get to church. We'll still do things. But inside, there is that, mm, what's happening on this island? What could happen on this island? There are many things that could discourage us. And so for us to be fully mature in Christ, I want you to be encouraged, as Paul would say. But our encouragement's going to come as we abide in his word and we get into his word. So here's the point. If you hear this every Sunday, what you should be doing and why you should be doing and the theology of it, but you don't stop doing some of the things you're doing so that you then will have the time to settle in his word and to draw from it, then you won't be encouraged. And so then what happens? You're going to go up and down with your encouragement. And when you are encouraged, it could be that day you spend in the Word. It could be that you really heard a great message and you were meditating on the Word of God in that message. And immediately when you got away from taking that, in, that infusion of encouragement, you drop again. Or your encouragement could come in a false, fake way. Where that you load up your life with, watch this, activities that, that give you what is known as an adrenaline rush. And you know what those are. I don't need to describe them. But whatever it is, it shoots your adrenaline up. Anything from a caffeine fix at Starbucks to some event that you go to. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of happiness. Kids are happy. You're happy. We're all laughing. We're focused on this. But it hasn't gotten us away from the day-to-day -day issues of life that are very real. So then what happens is we sell ourselves on a false sense of, of encouragement based on circumstances instead of on the sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And so then we're up when we have a happy event and then we're back down and discouraged when we're not. And so Paul is agonized with these people that they would be fully mature in Christ, encouraged by his word, the word of God. And so that's what I'm encouraging you to do. So now you come back and say, what am I doing in my life right now that I do not have a consistent, meaningful, quiet time? A quiet time. But it's more than that. Am I in a small group setting, a connection group, whether it's on Sunday morning or, or in the middle of the week or Friday night? Am I in a connection group where the word of God is premier and we're learning what it has to say amidst all of that fellowship? So I'm feasting on the word. And then another place to get it. Am I in a one-on-one -on -one discipleship? I don't like to use the word accountability relationship, but where I am with someone talking about Scripture, not double coupons over at the, uh, at the grocery store, or talking about Christian things or Christian activities, but talking about the Word and getting to know Him more. And then what is our, our commitment to being together as one corporate body to see the largeness of us all, worshiping together regularly on Sunday? Where that the other things that in life that are crowding out those events, a personal time, a one-on-one, -on -one, a small group, or a, and a large group, is killing us from that, keeping us from that. And that's what's hindering. And so the agony is, as I know, it's right there. It's all for you. All the mechanism is there. Going to an event isn't going to make you spiritual. Going to church won't make you spiritual. Going to connection group won't make us spiritual. Sitting in a small group won't make you spiritual. Those are just our boundaries. Those are just a canned, on-the-calendar events. 
but they are focused and intentionalized so that you could get something out of that because the Word of God becomes the center of it. So you have your private time, your less private time, and your big public time. And he says, you'll be encouraged by doing that. Let's go a little bit further because Paul knew how important it was for them to be encouraged. Number two, he says, having been united in love. And so now he meant from the encouragement he got, he's now united in love. When you're united in love, there's more of an opportunity for us to grow to spiritual maturity. Let me see if I can explain that to you. There's two words there. One is the word united, and the other one is united in love. Sometimes leaderships of churches try to force everybody to be united around a cause or an event or a function or a purchase or or maybe even a direction of a church. And so you're trying to get, you're getting united around certain things that not everybody might buy into because whatever those things are, they could be very good and eventually they could bring glory to the Lord. There's no doubt about that. But on the other hand, it becomes still how different people will touch it. So here he didn't say united around building a building. He didn't say, I'm so glad that you're united around buying more chariots to pick up people to come to church. He says, what you're united around is the love. And so what's going to draw us together and ultimately what will keep us together when we go through hard times is the genuine, unselfish sacrifice of loving everybody just the way they are. It's not the emotion of, okay, we agree, therefore we have closeness. We agree, therefore I really love you. Really love says it's not based on warm feelings, it's based upon a need. If you have a need, it's not about what we agree with or don't agree with, it's that you have a genuine need. And the first need, obviously, is the root need of getting to know Christ better. Sometimes it could be a surface need to get to the root need, but it's a genuine united in love. And so I would say that as this church, we might struggle with certain things, but the uniting of of us is around the love that we have one toward another. That's our, our clarion call. I met another lady who's a guest here today. And she said, you know, you walk in here, you hear the talk in the lanai, and people are here. There's love here in this place. Well, that's a sign now of us growing to spiritual maturity. Francis Schaeffer, in a book called The Mark of a Christian, said this. He called the unity of the church the final apologetic to the watching world. I thought that's a profound state. Or the final proof to a watching world that we're Christians, we're authentic, is because of the love we have. The funny thing is, what Schaeffer said he was only taking from Scripture... John 13, 34, and 35 said the same thing, that the mark of us being authentic Christians is going to be the fact that we love one another. We can learn all the technical reason why we know the Bible is the Word of God, but if we don't love one another, immediately it shows that maybe what the Bible is saying isn't true because authentic Christianity will be united together in love. Maybe not united together on a cause, but we will be united together in love around Jesus Christ and Him alone. Well, a strong heart also comes from number three, and that is experiencing full assurance of understanding. As you go back to the passage here, he talks about, he says, I'm in anguish over you all. I have have agony over you all that your hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all the riches, the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Boy, he says it twice there. I want you to know knowledge and wisdom. I want you to know there's treasures and riches in that, and it's all found in the person of Jesus Christ. Now I'm coming back full circle. A moment ago, I was encouraging you on the thought of being encouraged. What's going to encourage you is being in God's Word. When you are in God's Word and you're living God's Word, we're going to be united together in love. And when we're united together in love, we're going to have a richness in our understanding of the knowledge and the wisdom of Christ. It's only going to come when we carve out of our life time again to be in God's Word and let it change our life. Let me try to show you the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge tells you why and what. Wisdom tells you how. There are people that can have great knowledge. They can know the why of Scripture and debate great theology. They can also know what to do, have the training of how do you now live your Christian life. But the wisdom is the how to actually put it into your daily life. And what he's saying here is that you would have understanding of the great riches of the balance of the understanding the knowledge and the wisdom together that's going to come from God's Word. So if our church is going to grow in a healthy way, then our health is going to come as we grow to become more fully like Jesus Christ. And that's going to come when we fully embrace the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of God's Word. We know that to be true. Are you letting it change your life? 
My question to you is, when was the last time you had a meaningful, quiet time with God and His Word to the point you weren't speed reading the Bible, but when you walked away from your quiet time, you chose to think, speak, or live differently? When was the last time you did that? Because I know when you're not there, the more you drift, there's going to be that atrophy in your spiritual walk. Secondly, when was the last time you went to a meaningful connection group, whether it's in the middle of the week or Sunday morning, or are you skipping? Look at Sunday morning. Just get up an hour earlier. Here it is, godly people working hours to prepare spiritual food for you to get together so you could have this training available to you, not in place of a quiet time, but in addition to it, it's like getting a little bit more spiritual fertilizer from God's Word. You have that opportunity. So just get up an hour earlier. What are you doing all week long that's more important than one hour than with a connection group maybe in the middle of the week? Now think about it for a moment. I'm agonizing and let me just pour out my heart to you. Pastors can give you a lot of fluff. They can do this stuff, but I don't want to do this. I care for you. I want you to grow. What is so important on a Sunday morning that would keep you from being here? What a testimony for you to be together to worship and love one another. What joy there is. What laughter on the lanai. It's all there. And then you have the word that's taught here, carefully, prayerfully, well thought out, biblical, verse by verse, often. And so he says, I want you to grow. I'm agonizing you. But now let me go a little bit further. He didn't just say, I agonize that you be more like Christ, but he also agonized in a secondary. He says, Paul agonized for people to reject deceitfulness strongly. In the verse it says, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Now this I say, what does he say? He says two things. I agonize over you. And secondly, he says, I want you to be fully mature in Christ through being encouraged, united in love, and of course, having a greater understanding. He says, I want you to know I'm saying these things. But now if you know these things, you then won't be deceived with persuasive words. Now, would you take your pencil for a moment and it says, should deceive you? Underline the word you, should deceive you. When I read that passage and I'm thinking, why would Paul write that then and God would want me to have it today because he preserved it in Scripture? That must mean that I could, as a believer in Christ, because he's not writing to unsaved people, he's writing to Christians, that I could have the propensity to be deceived. <gasps> could I be deceived? The answer is yes. Could you be deceived after all these years? Could you be deceived from knowing exact truth? And Paul is saying, I'm saying all this to you. I'm agonizing you so that you won't be deceived. What a great heartache it would be for you someday to wake up finally in heaven and to know for many, many years you could have had different rewards or other things you were missed out on because you've allowed yourself to be deceived. He's going to now tell you who are the deceivers. And then he's going to tell you and me how we're deceived. So one argument could be, I'm deceived because I have all these deceivers in my life. And so we could put too much time blaming deceivers, which there are plenty of them out there. Or what we could do is to recognize there are deceivers, but even though I'm living in a world of deception, I don't have to be deceived. So what do I need to do to step up in this world so I now can prevent myself? from being deceived from that truth. And that's really what he's speaking about. He'll warn you. He'll tell you who are the deceivers. Let's look at the passage now. Follow along, he says. They'll deceive you with persuasive words. Now, what does it mean to be deceived? It means to be misled or led someone astray. So there's going to be people who, using persuasive words or arguments, will now lead you astray. For though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm there in the spirit. Back in Colossae, if I can take you back for a couple of months when we started our study, you'll know that Colossae, the city there, was very much like Honolulu. They had people that worshipped angels, New Age people. There were people that worshipped other gods. There were people that worshipped uh, works in order to get to heaven. So, in a sense, the spiritual and cultural society of Colossae 2,000 years ago is very much like Honolulu. So now, let's take it into the Honolulu days. Just like they could have been deceived in those days, Paul would be writing to us today that say, be very careful. In your society, you too could be deceived by persuasive words. Now, I'd like to give us one extra caution that he couldn't give back then. In the Bible days, there was no internet. 
In the Bible days, there was no uh, cable TV. In the Bible days, there was no dish network where you could suck from all over the world any kind of ism and spasm more quickly right in the comfort and the privacy of your own home without anyone being there to shut the channel off or change the channel that was coming at your way or to get you off that internet site or to turn the radio off or to keep the publications from coming in your mailbox. There was nothing going on to that. They were just living in just a general world. We live in a world that not only do we have the same things, they had neighbors, we have neighbors. They had work, we had work. They had military, we had military. They had kids, we had kids. They had education, we had education. But in addition to that, we also have all this other stuff that is being mainlined, it is being pumped, it is being shoved, it is being screamed at us. And in the midst of all of that, there'll be truth. But far more, there's going to be a little bit of truth mixed in with a whole lot of air. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.